Uh, I, I think that's a great way to look at things, you know, I mean, and, and cutting your days into, you know, your time into thirds like that. Um, then what are you gonna do in the book? To, so, okay, so wait, wait, so let's talk about the book really quick. Tell me about, you know, the, the, the concept of the book, the, you know, the kind of the summary and, and, you know, what inspired you there? So what inspired, I'll start with what inspired me. What inspired me was frustration. <laughs> is that I'd go to these conferences and you'd listen to these thought leaders talk and you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Like that has a 0% probability of coming true to their predictions on the future of work. And specifically, there was a prediction that was all the rage in the world of HR and everybody would talk about it. And they would say the on-demand economy, which is currently 25% of the labor force in 2010, 2011, 2012, it's gonna be 50% by 2020. I would be like, 0% chance of that, not going to happen. It's a ridiculous prediction. And so I started to write down why I thought it was a ridiculous prediction, right? What is my, because, you know, if I'm going to have a point of view, I should defend it. What is the data? What is the evidence that I'm using to defend my point of view? And that began the journey of writing a book, which was, well, let's look at history. Let's look at the data trends and patterns. And let's look at how companies actually engage workers and deploy capital. Because if you're starting to think about things with that, those series of lenses, you can start to really put together a high probability vision of the world of work, whether it's the on-demand world of work, the remote world of work, or how robots and AI are going to impact jobs. Because in the very early stages of me finishing the book, as I had morphed from the on-demand economy into the entire world of work, there was the 50% of jobs are gonna go in the next 10 years. Right, McKinsey predicts 50% of jobs, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Oxford University. That is not what any of those studies say. For those of us that spent their days reading through the Bureau of Labor Statistics and all these other reports that come out, which I don't recommend to anybody, uh, that, that is not what any of those reports said. But in our social media-driven world, somebody got that headline and it went out. And that is another area of frustration where you want to say, no, no, no. We need to be thoughtful. And that is what I hope people take away from the book, Gary, is that you can't paint the labor market with a broad brush. You need to think industry by industry, function by function, company by company in some cases, as you predict how their labor forces are going to evolve. And when you hear a new technology that comes on stream, do not jump to the simplistic conclusion that all jobs are going to go. And one of the examples I talk about in the book, and, and uh, I'll kind of run through it if you'd like, is, is the ATM. You know, when the ATM came out, everyone said, oh my gosh, every bank teller job in the United States is going to go. And over the next 25 years, we had a 20% increase in the number of bank tellers employed in the United States, right? Not the 1995, every single bank teller is going to go. That's not what happens. And the ATM, by the way, it's not even trying to disguise what it is. It's an automated teller machine, it's automating, it's a machine that automates the job of the teller. Like it's trying to remove the teller and it couldn't and it won't. But the complexity comes in that the number of bank tellers per branch did actually drop from an average of 21 down to 13, which is what we would tend to see when you see a machine that performs a lot of the component tasks of a job, is you see some job losses but the number of bank branches in the United States nearly doubled. And thus we ended up with more bank tellers. And it nearly wow. doubled because of the Glass-Steagall re repeal. And so the point of the anecdote is just to say, this stuff is really complicated. And you can't just say, oh, ATM is just bank teller jobs go. Maybe, but let's really dive in and let's look at this industry. Let's look at the competitive environment. Because if I walk into a Chase branch and there's no one to greet me with a lollipop, and to say, how you doing and everything else, they're just a bunch of machines. But I walk into city and they say, how are you, Mr. Wald? It's lovely to see you. We have some lollipops. I'm probably going to city, right? I'm not going back to Chase. Like the competitive- Like you like your lollipops. My main point here is that I really enjoy lollipops. That is actually my main takeaway. <laughs> and, okay, so, so in your book, the, the, then it's basically all about that. It's all about labor yeah. and, and the change in labor, right? Yes. Um, well, the, the, give us the name of the title of your book again. It is The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. End of Jobs. Yep. And it was super, look, I would say it was super fun to write because it was super fun. It's very difficult to write a book. It's certainly difficult to write a book while you're building a company. 
Uh, and so I am a high, you know, you got to create leverage where you can. And so half of the book is actually predictions by other people. And so chapter 10, which is my favorite chapter, is something I call the Future of Work Prize. Um, I have the pleasure of being an advisor to the X Prize on their Future of Work initiatives. And so I kind of copied them and I said, you know what, let me get 20 different people, 20 men and women that are actually shaping the future of work, leaders of the largest staffing firms, leaders of the largest labor unions, leaders of the largest companies in the executive suite. And let me ask them what they think the world of work looks like in 2040. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you can do it any way you want, write however you want, whatever angle you want. I'm not going to edit it for content. And we actually got 40 people that ended up writing uh, and we selected down the best 20 that went into the book. Well, that's cool. All different, uh, all different views or visions, right? Very, very different. I mean, we have the labor leaders that are very dystopian about how the world's going to look and workers are totally screwed in 2040. We have some business leaders that are very much of the utopian future where robots and AI are taking all of our mundane tasks away and it's a world of abundance and this and that, which is a world I, I tend to believe that one more. And then I've got one writer that basically wrote that eh, everything's going to kind of be the same. Little changes here, little changes there, but for the most part, same stuff, different day.